This time we have someone new with us. The little guy there is uh, Matthew Hedinger, 10-year-old aspiring Python programmer. <laughs> Not yet ready for structural uh, pattern matching. How many of you went to the uh, first structural pattern matching uh, uh, talk? Fantastic. I believe that was kind of a beginner level talk, an introduction to it. I'd like to take it uh, up one notch. Structural pattern matching is really cool. It's kind of surprising. There's tricks involved. There's uh, little dance moves that you would learn after you had used it for a long time. I'd like to show you what you will have learned if you just start using it a lot in practice. And I'll show you what the common use cases are. I'll show you some of the dance moves and how to get around some of the uh, common problems, the things that the peps don't uh, uh, tell you about. So we'll go in and uh, do this at an intermediate level. Uh, let's see what's on this slide. There's my name. I train people in uh, Python, so if you need me to train you, uh, give me a call, and I'll uh, come to your company. I do code reviews for companies as well. Uh, follow me on uh, Twitter, Raymond H. Uh, that's reasonably important. I don't tweet about fun movies I see. I tweet about Python. I teach Python by Twitter. Uh, when I learn something new about Python, I share it with you. So I think this is a worthwhile account to follow. I'll send out all of these slides later so you don't have to memorize anything that's on it. Okay. Uh, Raymond, sorry, uh, if you don't mind. Just a very quick thing. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, please use Slido. There's the QR here you can use. So uh, use Slido to, to pop your questions and I will review later. All right. There's procedures. Okay. Inter introduction. Ah. Bigger. I can. I'm from Texas. I can do big. Big is what we do. All right. The number one thing that goes wrong when people encounter structural pattern matching is they think they're working with Python. Do any of you know Python? That will be harmful for you. You need to put this Python out of your, uh, your brain. There is a language that looks exactly like Python. It has the same grammar, but the grammar means very different things. How many of you ever used a variable in your code? Variables don't behave the same way. Variables make an assignment. They uh, uh, don't do uh, lookups. How many of you have ever used parentheses to make an instance of a class? That's not what it does here. It uh, does an is instance check on the uh, uh, class. How many of you have ever used square brackets to make a list? This is not what it does. Are the square brackets here pattern match on the list? Have I convinced you that everything inside a case clause is different from the grammar you already know? So whenever you work with this, the first thing you want to think is in terms of this grammar. And this is pretty much all you need to know. Variable names assign. Parentheses trigger a class pattern. Dots trigger a value pattern. And we will use this one a lot. Use and abuse and override. And we will use this particular pattern to get around a lot of problems. And we'll also use the parentheses version to get around a very interesting problem for uh, has attribute. So inside this grammar is the solutions to every problem that you're going to have. There are things that you don't see on this grammar, like sets. You don't see regular expressions. Do you think we'll be able to fit them in? Yes, we can. I'll show you how to do all of those things. So uh, I've got some general guidelines uh, for you. Uh, first one is remember that the case statements are uh, effectively equal to a big if, else, if chain. If, 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 if. What that means is the very first case uh, that matches is the winning uh, uh, case. So when you're ordering your cases, the first thing you want to do is order for correctness. Correctness is more important than anything else. And the time that this matters is when you have overlapping cases. And the uh, specific case needs to go before the general case, which is interesting because when we're thinking about problems, we tend to think of the general first, then the specific. The case ordering is exactly the reverse. We'll see examples of this. Once you've ordered for correctness, the next thing you want to order for is uh, speed. Because this is an if-else-if if, uh, uh, chain, if you have 100 cases, and an important case is at the bottom, every single time you match, it's going to have to work its way down. This is a surprise to some people because they come from other languages, compiled languages, where case statements can vector directly uh, to the uh, uh, matching case. Ours goes one at a time. Where should you put your common cases? Toward the top or the bottom? The top. That will make them go fast. 
a very common problem is that we teach people in Python anywhere that you've used a, uh, a literal, you can replace it with a variable. In fact, that's one of the most basic things we teach programmers. Take something specific, put it in a function, then take all of the hardwired constants and replace them with uh, variables. It's one of the most basic programming skills. So if you're a decent programmer, should you go around replacing uh, constants with variables? Of course you could, except in a language that's completely different from Python. Name a language that's completely different from Python. Structural pattern matching. Okay. So this will be a common need is you've got a literal and you want to replace it with a variable or a function call or an expression. And so what we're going to do is use the value pattern. The value pattern is the one with a dot. And if we use the dot, we can uh, link in uh, variables or expressions. Now I'm going to show you how to put in arbitrary expressions, variables, and constants in that are named. Uh, that will solve a number one problem that people have. And lastly, if the uh, list of uh, cases is exhaustive, it isn't always, but if it is, add a wildcard case at the end. There's a couple reasons to do this. One is, you say, I think I know all four possible cases, north, south, east, and west. And then somebody puts in north by northwest. You would uh, catch, with this uh, catch-all uh, at the bottom, uh, a wildcard case, you would catch that erroneous input. But that is not the main reason to put the catch-all at the end. The main reason to put it at the end is the number one mistake that people make with structural uh, uh, pattern matching is they replace a constant with a variable. And what happens when you replace a constant with a variable? What do variables always do? I'm pointing at the answer. It assigns. Interestingly, not only does it assign, it always matches. And you can't have two cases that match everything, that will trigger an error. And that's an error that you want. So if you uh, put a wildcard case at the bottom of your list of uh, uh, patterns and then accidentally make a mistake in one of the other uh, uh, cases, you'll trigger an error, which is what you want, and it'll tell you the other case matches everything. But without the wildcard pattern, uh, it will go ahead and process. It will look like it's working correctly, but it will be making assignments and matching always, which is almost never what you want. So those are my uh, uh, general rules. I have some good tools for you. I'm going to show you the things that I use to make my life happier, and I could A, save them for the end and risk running out of time and you don't see them, or B, give them to you right at the beginning. Which do you prefer? All right. Some, uh, some previously seen technologies and some not previously seen technologies. Here we go. Class Ver. I use this one all the time. I put variables uh, in here. You can make assignments to the class and look up uh, class variables. It's just a namespace for holding what? Variables. Okay. Named variables. And what's cool about them is when you store them in the class, you look them up with a dot, which is the value pattern, which means that you can now put uh, variables in your cases. So we'll uh, take a look at those shortly. And then I use a similar class for constants. Do you think I ever change those? No, because they're the opposite of variables. They are constants. Okay. These are two obvious technologies. There's several other ways to do it. Sometimes for constants, people use uh, enum class, which I believe is throwing way too much firepower at way too small of a problem. You can also use a, a simple namespace. That said, these are well named. This is a variable, and this is a constant, and that's what I want to be reminded of when I use them. Here's one, though, that is a little bit more surprising. It's called func call. What do you think it does? It calls a function, but it's a descriptor. It has a, uh, a dunder get method and a set name so it knows what name it's been assigned to. This is great because uh, inside a uh, function or inside a case statement, what will happen if you use parentheses? What does it always trigger? A class pattern, which means it's impossible to put a function call inside a case statement because it'll run a class pattern instead. But sometimes you need function calls. How do you get there? The answer is pretty easy. 
well, I say it's pretty easy. With this tool, it becomes pretty easy. This uh, will let you use the value pattern, which is the dot, which will trigger the descriptor and call the function for you. So this little tool lets you put arbitrary function calls inside a case statement. That might sound exotic to you, but there's a very common need for this, and the common need is in Git text when you use uh, translations to uh, uh, foreign languages. So you might want to uh, have case north, south, east, and west, but switch to uh, a Spanish, el norte, uh, del sur, uh, or uh, switch to uh, French, uh, I don't know. I know how to read them, but not say them. I think it's nor, spelled nord, and sud, which I don't know how it's pronounced either. I'm not good at French pronunciation. But the idea is whenever the language changes, you want your case matches to change as well. That would take a function call. This tool will do it for you. This one is really cool as well. By the way, just because these things are small doesn't mean that they're obvious, and it doesn't mean that they're not powerful. These are super powerful uh, tools, and most people, I think if you gave them an interview question to solve these problems, would not come up with these uh, answers. So uh, I believe the last two are technologies that have not been announced previously anywhere. So uh, these are for you. What does this do? We subclass a string, and then we override equality. When we're doing the equality test, the other side of the uh, uh, test is a regular expression pattern, and we match the pattern. So here's how they're used. Uh, I define a constant pi, and now if I put constant dot pi, it looks it up. It just stores it in the namespace. Why do we care about that? Because the dot is the value pattern, and then you can now put constant dot pi in one of your cases. If you tried just pi, that would be a variable, which always does what? makes an assignment and always matches. Two things that you don't want. So this now allows you to put const, named constants in your uh, uh, code. Variables work the same way, except unlike constants, variables change, which is why we call them variables. So we can store in this variable here, modify the variable, and this is important if the value of, that you're matching in the case changes between consecutive uh, uh, calls. Okay. So now you have the ability to put named constants and uh, uh, named variables inside uh, your match case. We'll see examples of these being used shortly, but remember, I decided to give you all the good stuff first. Okay, funk call. How does it work? So I make a class and I make a funk call, and this is going to call which function? I'm pointing at the answer. Ord. So ORD gives you the ordinal position of a character in the ASCII or Unicode uh, table. So the ORD of the letter X is one to code point 120 in the ASCII table, and Y is 121. So when I put a dot X, the dot trig uh, does a lookup into a class, which is this class. It's a function call object, and instead of an instance of function call, because it's a descriptor, it calls the underlying function for you. So when I put a.x, it actually runs the function ORD. When I put a.y, it runs ORD again, but this time with a different argument. That lets you pass in the attribute name uh, to a general function. This tool allows you to take any function call you need to uh, make inside a case statement and attach it easily with just one, uh, one line. It'll say this attribute should uh, always call this function, and you can put in uh, dynamic computations inside your case statements. We'll need that for the uh, language translation example. And the last one is just uh, beyond uh, uh, cool. I take the string hello, and I wrap it in regex equal. It's still a regular string. It prints like a regular string because regex equal is a uh, subclass of string. Only one method has been overridden. Which one is it? Equality. equality. And the equality runs a regular expression match. So when I have uh, regex equal hello, I can now ask, is it equal to this regular expression? And it says true. Because it starts with an H, ends with an O, and has zero or more characters in between, it matches that regular expression. 
this is beyond cool. It means that you can make a list of cases now that are all regular expressions. And then in the match uh, uh, clause, you would match the string. You wrap it in a regex match. Who thinks that's cool? It is. Yeah. All right. It's one of the number one things people want to do with their case statements that they can't do. There was a decision early on about whether to uh, support regexes uh, directly. There, uh, and one of the reasons was it seemed to really open a can of worms. Another reason is that the regex module isn't intrinsically part of Python. It's a standalone module, and you could replace it with other regex modules. But as soon as we hardwired it into the language with the uh, 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 case statement, we'd no longer be able to change regexes. And there are other regex modules nicer than the ones in the uh, standard library. So we would have locked it in. Also, no good syntax was proposed for it uh, that matched anything else in Python. The closest that we found was two slashes, which are uh, to wrap a uh, regular expression, as was done in uh, awk. But that takes regular expressions from a function that you call to being an intrinsic part of uh, the language. And the decision was made, let's stick with bits of grammar that match grammar what we already have. Uh, it's a lot easier to give people things later and add on than it is to take things away. So that was a, a reasonable conservative choice. But what do people want to do anyway? Match regular expressions. What do you need to do it? Just this. So this is my little tool set for you. I'll give you a link to the slides. If you use these with pattern matching, uh, you will be able to overcome many problems. Who learned something new? Fantastic. All right, uh, let's go on to examples. All right. So this is a case statement style use of uh, of a match case. And whenever I say case statement style, I'm saying it's what you can do with case statements in other language. It takes, it uses the, uh, does minus 10 mean I've used up 10 or I've got 10 left? You have 10 left. 10 left. Just All right. Okay. okay. I've got 10 pounds of potatoes to put into a five pound sack. When we get to the questions, I can tell you the many of them you can How many uh, minutes for questions? No, how many minutes for questions? Ten minutes. Okay, all right. right. All right, good enough. All right, so in this ex when I talk about uh, a case statement example, I'm saying like you would do with a case in another language. So this is all uh, literals uh, here. One of the things I like about this example, we're implementing the uh, date format uh, uh, codes, which most people think of as being very complex. How much difficulty would it take for you to add a formatting language for, your, uh, uh, for any of your objects? I think this answer suggests it doesn't take much effort at all to do that. I'll start with how we use it. I want to format this string with a date format. We want to recognize this percent H, look up the uh, H case, and return the current timestamps uh, hour uh, formatted, which happens right here. We want to not look this one up and just put the colon in uh, directly. So I'm running all of the codes down here. This is the format string, and this is the output. Not terribly difficult to implement. Uh, just got a bunch of cases. So what are the things to notice here? One is the cases are independent. So because they're independent, the ordering doesn't matter for correctness. I could shuffle these around, and any permutation would still give a uh, correct answer. But what does it matter for always? Speed. So I probably ought to reorder this so that hours, minutes, and seconds, month, day, and year go at the top. And more exotic formatting uh, 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 codes like calendar month abbreviation move down toward the uh, uh, bottom. Also, another thing to notice is that I use the wildcard pattern at the bottom. That is the uh, underscore. One reason to do that is if later, Somebody comes in to maintain my code and replaces this with a variable. Uh, lowercase s is equal to the string s. That would cause a 100% always match here and an assignment, which is never what you want. But because this one is here, we will get an error, and it will tell you that you have two universal uh, uh, matches. Okay. 
So uh, this is helpful for unknown inputs, but it's also useful for detecting an error if you take the quotes off of this one and uh, there's a matching variable, you'll get an error. So my recommendation is to almost always put this in here, even if it's not possible to have a non-matching uh, uh, case. It prevents other errors as, uh, as well. Okay, language tokenizer. All right, so this is a little bit more advanced example. Um, uh, I'm creating a new programming language here. It looks a little bit like Pascal. It has uh, semicolons at the end. It has assignments with a uh, colon equal, and it has words reminiscent of uh, Visual uh, Basic inside. Okay, so that is my new language. The first step in implementing a language is to make a tokenizer. Uh, and that will help you write a compiler or an interpreter. So the goal is to break the input text into tokens where you have the type, the value, and position information. So when I tokenize these statements, the output says the word if is a special reserved word and it's on line two, column eight. What's followed by if is an identifier. The category of thing is an identifier. The value of the identifier is the quantity and here's the location. We now get the keyword uh, uh, then. And uh, along the way, we're categorizing uh, things that are numbers and their values separately. And this can be fed to a down, downstream step from a uh, tokenizer is called a, uh, a parser. <laughs> okay. And I only want five minutes for questions, so you can add five. Okay. All right, throwing off the uh, uh, timekeeper. So this is uh, 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 fantastic, but I'm not interested in that part. I'm interested in what it takes to uh, implement it. So we start with a, uh, a regular expression for each of the categories. What, do, what does an assignment look like? It's always a uh, colon equal. What is the pattern for a number, any integer or decimal? What are the supported uh, operators? So an, uh, anytime you see a plus or a star, it's considered an operator. And so these are the categories of things. The thing to notice is that uh, my catch-all this time is not going to be in my case statement. It's going to be in the regular expression. And there's a reason for that. If you put the catch-all in the regular expression, this part that says, I'll match anything that doesn't match something else, because it matches uh, uh, in the regular expression, we get position information and can make error reporting. There is an unknown, unexpected character at this line in this uh, uh, point. So that's a reason to move it out of uh, the case statement. So uh, this is kind of a st standard technique for joining all of those components together into one big regular expression. We loop over the input, tokenizing one match object at a time, uh, extracting which group it is, the group name, the value of the group, and uh, computing its position. So here's the match case uh, portion of it, which is the uh, number, the ID, the new line, and skip. But notice that I don't have a catch-all here. And the reason is I don't want to handle all of these cases. These are the ones that have special handling. Numbers get <coughs> converted to a float or an integer. This part only runs if the ID happens to be a keyword. Otherwise, it's a generic uh, identifier. So here's our learning points here. We can't combine a literal pattern and a value pattern in one case statement. So what we use is a guard instead. There is a way to put this part as a case statement. There's a way to put this card as a case statement, but there's no way to combine the two different kinds of uh, uh, patterns together. So a guard is kind of your last resort for compound uh, uh, criteria. We match on ID, but only if the value is in the keywords. So that is kind of the uh, interesting learning point in that one. Also, you learned that we omitted the wildcard pattern because I want to fall through all of these cases. And the other learning point, and all this will be in the notes that I give to you, is the mismatch catch-all case is up in the regex. And we use that uh, so that we can get error reporting uh, uh, information. All right. Next one up, do something interesting, inverting test. And I expected I was going to have some JSON examples here. There, 
supersonic samples. All right. Let's do some uh, JSON example. Pattern matching really shines when you use the matching uh, a part of it, not just as a uh, case statement. So a JSON line example, this could, uh, if you take the square brackets out, this is called JSON lines with the square brackets, it's standard JSON. Either way, you have a bunch of lines, components that are JSON onto themselves. So we read them in and I loop over the history. Each line is uh, one game. So uh, we've played a number of uh, uh, matches. So I loop over and I match the game and say, I want the games where we won and I'd like to capture what the date is. This is just like an SQL statement where you make a query, select game date where the game was a victory. So you've learned that you can use this for SQL style uh, queries. That is a top use case for uh, uh, pattern matching and it's one of the reasons you're going to really love it. Now standard JSON is typically has uh, multiple levels of uh, nesting. So here's an excerpt of a data set where I have a book identifier and information about a book. Dictionary inside a dictionary, two levels is very common and normal for uh, a JSON. I'd like to show you how nicely the queries can be matched for it. In this case, I loop over all of the books, that's the inner dictionaries. I'm matching the computer books and extracting the title and price. In SQL, this would be select name and price uh, from catalog where genre equal computer. Can you see how nicely the SQL translates into Python? I think that is rather beautiful. If you are in the data analysis business and are not using the full power of pandas, uh, this is a tool for you. But here's something really special that I think people overlook when they first uh, learn pattern matching, is that the patterns can nest. So in this case, I'm not matching on one of the books, I'm matching the entire catalog. This says jump down to BK107, and inside that is another dictionary where I want to pull out the author and uh, title. So this is like the SQL, select author and title from catalog where the book ID is uh, BK104. Uh, I also think that it's really cool nesting a dictionary inside a dictionary. Everybody likes JSON. Nobody likes nested dictionary calls, square brackets, square brackets, square brackets, loop, square brackets, square brackets, loop, square brackets, and this cuts through it like a hot knife through butter. You like this? Yeah, yeah this is a prime motivating real world uh, example. One of my problems with the other uh, pattern matching talks that I've heard is they almost always give you toy examples. I want to show you stuff you're going to really use. So this one is beyond cool. One of the things that characterizes JSON is it can uh, hit, uh, support arbitrary tree structured data. And we know how to deal with that, recursion. And so uh, recursion, you have to have cases to decide whether to recurse on or not. So here is a toy data set. I had a real data set for this to run on, but it was huge. So here's a toy data set. This is a multi-level tree uh, that has been pretty printed a dictionary that contains a uh, list that contains other uh, dictionaries. What I'd like to do is write a, uh, a function called path to that says locate the number seven in that tree. So recurse over it and find where the seven is. Once you find it, give me the full path to it. And it says the path to it is look up square brackets two in this outer dictionary, which is this part. Then square brackets three, which is the third element in the uh, list, zero, one, two, three. Then run a square brackets seven. Who thinks this is kind of cool? If you're working with network topologies and you say, where did this IP address or interface name from? This will chop, hop down 20 levels of JSON and give you the direct path to something. Uh, this is a model for how you can traverse anything in JSON. Now that you know what it can do, would you like to see the code? Yes, pattern matching makes short work of this. So uh, we're searching for a target, which is the number seven. So we want to know if the node that we're looking at is actually the number seven, in which case we'll return uh, a direct hit. If, it's, uh, if we don't find any match at all, we return an empty uh, uh, string. Our problem is I don't know in advance that that is the number seven. It's a variable. 
you remember the recipe from before uh, where we used the value patterns? I say variable.target. I can't put the word target right here without the dot in front of it because what does a variable name do always in a, a structural pattern matching? Assign and match 100% of the time, which is not what you uh, uh, want. Uh, so, what I do is take my variable namespace, assign into it, and now I can use a variable here. Without this technique, this is a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, this is the class pattern. We're matching a list and we're uh, matching uh, uh, dictionaries. Uh, this part is super technical. Inverting test, how to make a test go backwards. We have a not is instance here. I'm going to because I'm so low on time, I'll just quickly scan the solution for that. Uh, the uh, wimpiest way to do it is to make a universal match, a wild card, and then just put in uh, uh, a guard. Another way to do it is to make a positive version of the test, saying I'm matching a list and dictionary, so that you know that later, if you've matched list and dictionary, by the time you get here, it can't be a list and dictionary anymore. So you use the universal match for, I want this to happen when it's not a list or a, a dictionary. That technique is neat. However, it's not always possible to reorder the uh, test, which we did here. So you have to put a match inside an, um, a match. This is not beautiful, but when you're converting if ellipse to a match case, sometimes you have to do this. You have an existing match case and you have to put a negative case in. These are, as far as I can tell, the only solutions to that uh, uh, problem. Uh, how to match a set or frozen set? Okay. I'll leave the most amazing one here up on the screen because I'm officially out of time and I have no time to tell you how to convert has attribute test by using object and matching fields. These two bits of code are equivalent. People tend to not to be able to discover that on their own. Of course, I had no time to tell you that, so uh, I'm not going to mention it at all. Those two are equivalent. <laughs> okay, I'll give you all my notes. Thank you so much. I'm going to use an advanced Q&A technology and uh, Oh, did you have time for Q&A? No. Uh, my advanced Q&A technology is I'm going to stand out in the hallway, and if you want to mob me there, that'd be great. Uh, say hello to uh, Matthew and uh, Rachel for me. Thank you again for the invitation.